afternoon and welcome to the City of Rapid City's Legal and Finance Committee meeting for Wednesday, November 29th, 2017. I'd like to start the meeting with the roll call and determination of quorum, please. Thank you. Uh, now's the time to adopt today's agenda. If there's any seated committee member who would like to make a modification to today's agenda, um, I'd like you to buzz in now. If not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt today's agenda as presented. Second. I've got a motion by Armstrong to adopt today's agenda as presented, second by Drury. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Today's agenda has been adopted. Now is the time for general public comment. This is the time for any member in the audience to address the seated committee members on any item that is currently not on today's agenda. I have no speaker request forms. Am I missing anyone in the audience? Seeing no one, we're moving on to the consent items. Consent items today are items one through eight. At this time, I'll open public comment for consent items <coughs> one through eight. I currently have no speaker request forms. Am I missing anyone? Seeing none, we're going to close public comment on consent items and the committee is now Addressing items one through eight. Is there any item a committee member would like to consider separately? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Move to approve. Second. Got a motion by Drury to approve consent items one through eight, second by Armstrong. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Consent items one through eight have been approved. We're now on to public comment for non-consent items, items nine through 11. I do have a speaker request form. Item number 10. And uh, would um, Hanny like to address us now or are you just available for questions? Yes, questions, yeah. questions, okay, all right. We will hold that for item number 10. Uh, any other speaker requests or speakers for non-consent items 9, 10, and 11? Seeing none, public comment is now closed. We'll move on to item number 9. Item number 9 is a second reading and recommendation of ordinance number 6028, an ordinance to allow artisan distillers as a conditional use in the central business district and the general commercial district by amending title 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. The chair would like to recognize Alderwoman Drew. Thank you, Madam Chair. I see, uh, is Patsy there for a question? Okay. Um, I just wanna uh, make it clear that this is just a, a land use permit or um, a conditional use permit that we're not actually doing the, the license to sell or, or have a um, off-sale distillery. Is that right, Joel? Yes, these licenses are issued through the state. We don't issue these licenses. Um, it just provides the, uh, a location in the city for these uses to uh, locate in if somebody were to obtain a license. So if you have a distillery and you want to operate somewhere in Rapid City, it's a private distillery and you wanted to operate, this is just to give them the ability to do that through a land use permit? Correct. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all I had. I currently, have a no uh, I currently do not have a motion. Is there any other committee member who would like to speak? If not, this is a second reading. I'd entertain a motion. Move to approve. Got a motion by Drury to approve. Second. Second by Drew. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10. Item number 10 is to approve resolution number 2017-099, a resolution to create Promise Road Tax Increment District, and resolution number 2017-100, a resolution to approve project plan for property generally described as being located northwest of the intersection of Cantron Boulevard and Mount Rushmore Road. We do have uh, Patsy Horton, and Patsy, if you'd like to give us a summary of this, Tiff. Good afternoon. This uh, proposal is located at the northwest corner of uh, Catron and Mount Rushmore Road. It's a new tax increment district that's proposed. Just a little background on what a TIF actually does. Um, today the base value uh, would be uh, generally located in the, this little quadrant. When we have a district, it freezes that tax base 
and anything that's been uh, developed after the base is set is generally in this increment area. And so with this district, all of the revenue from the increment will go to pay for um, the proposed project plan costs as identified um, today. We estimate that uh, by the time this district is, uh, by 2020, the value of the district will be about 13 million. Based on the year-end uh, valuation of the property, the current base valuation is three point, uh, just a little over three million. And just so everybody knows, um, all of the taxing agencies within this district will still receive the revenues identified in the columns for the base valuation until this district is paid off. So the school will still receive the 37,000 and, and the city, uh, excuse me, the school district will receive the $37,000, the city will receive the 9,800, the county will receive the 14,000, and then the water district will also receive its revenues. Nothing changes with the base valuation, those districts, those taxing entities still receive their numbers. Um, one of the questions that always surfaces is what happens to the school district because it's the revenue from the water district, the city and the county that go to pay for these increments. And with the school district revenues, um, because this is proposed as an economic development TIF, everybody across the state helps pay for the um, project costs within this district to cover the school district's um, increment that, that will be um, directed toward them. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind, state law does allow for a couple requirements for you guys to consider during this um, application uh, review. There are two different things to consider if it's blighted or whether it's for economic development. I've highlighted the areas where um, this particular application fits. It identifies that um, generally all of the property within the district will stimulate and develop the economic dis uh, the economic welfare and prosperity of the entire state through commercial development, and that um, the area is likely to enhance significantly the value of substantially all of the other property within the district. One of the things that you also have to consider is our major street plan. Here we have Mount Rushmore Road, which is identified as a principal arterial. We also have Catron, which is also a principal arterial. One of the um, items that will be constructed with this particular project is the collector street that extends uh, along Promise Road connecting from the existing terminus of Promise Road to Catron Boulevard right there at the uh, brand new signal at Les Hollers. We also have to take a look at our comprehensive plan and how it fits in. Generally, um, all of the uh, salmon color property is identified as a mixed-use commercial use. You can see the boundary of the district. And then we also have an activity center, and um, this is also an entrance corridor. We also have to take a look at the existing zoning, with the exception of the property um, identified on the very north end. All of the property is identified as a general zoning um, general commercial zoning district. We also look at the existing use within the um, district, uh, within the proposed district. There is a residential property on the 40 acres on the northwest corner. Everything else is vacant. Here's some pictures from uh, several months ago. This is looking from the south to the north. This is the location of where the cart ranch was. And here you can see a better uh, close-up view of where the uh, cart ranch used to be, looking to the north. And here's a picture looking south with the new hospital facility going in here. Just off the screen is Black Hills Corp. And if you were looking this way, that's where the proposed district is located. So one of the things that was submitted with um, this application is what the landowner could do with the existing road connection they had proposed making the connection over here to the service road. One of the uh, previous slides that I had shown you was the major street plan. We have on our major street plan the proposed collector that would connect right here. 
and that is actually what the applicant has proposed with this particular district. And here is a copy of what the public improvements are. They are going to realign and, and drop the intersection right there so that the sewer line that actually extends through here will connect with this particular alignment of Promise Road. As a private development cost, they are going to extend um, the connection over to this cul-de-sac. We're also going to get a pipe that will um, provide connection for the storm sewer. And here are the estimated costs. Here are the uh, public improvements, Promise Road at 2.2 million, um, realigning Promise Road is 500, and then the traffic signal adjustment is 100,000, and then we have interest and some professional and contingency fees. Then the applicant has also identified the uh, structural improvements and professional fees with non-TIF related costs, contingencies, financing, and here's what it would actually cost um, to make that connection on their master plan that I had shown you. One of the things that you have to consider with this particular district is that it overlaps an existing tax increment district. What happens with an overlapping district is any revenue generated in the proposed boundary will um, be directed to pay on tax increment district 70 before any increment is directed to the proposal. And so this is, this is kind of a map of some overlapping um, districts within this area. 70 has the hatched area. TID 76, which is Buffalo Crossing, that was approved at the end of last year. Black Hills Corp was also approved at the end of last year. And then you have the proposal before you today. And so all three of these districts, any revenue generated within that district are used to pay for TID 70 before any revenue goes to each of these other districts. And again, the master plan, one of the critical areas that staff had felt um, provided some uh, benefit for this district is that the realignment of Promise Road instead of using the existing frontage road. And again, the improvements. One thing I wanted to show you is um, DOT has been working on this particular intersection since 2004. The current alignment, and they are still working on the environmental assessment before the study is complete, is an urban single point interchange that clearly shows the realignment of Promise Road so that the service road can be um, removed. It provides a much safer um, access onto 16 than, than the service road. One thing I also wanted to show you is the estimated payoff. This is uh, at the end of last year when those, uh, we looked at these other two overlapping districts. The original date for the payoff of 70 with the first, dist first two districts was uh, 2022. That's still consistent. 76 was originally identified at uh, payoff as 2024. Um, with the existing building permits that I looked at through the end of 2016, that extends uh, 76 out to 32, and then 77 is extended beyond the 20-year time frame. With Promise Road, we anticipate the payoff after TID 70 is paid at 2023 or 2033. And we always ha also have to look at um, the total value of our property within um, tax increment districts. And to date, it's at about 2.95%, uh, just a little under 3%. So we are clearly within our 10% maximum that the state allows. So with that, uh, Planning Commission did recommend approval. Um, I do want to add just a couple things about um, this project plan that's before you. There are a couple uh, new pieces that I want to um, note in the project plan because there were some concerns from the last couple districts about reallocating uh, financing costs to use for capital costs. I included in the project plan that as part of the agreement, we would address that, that any amendments that come forward to reallocate costs based on existing expenditures, 
that the financing cannot be used for those capital costs. They just have to use only the contingency costs. And that I also identified the school district funding um, throughout the life of the TIF. Generally, we just leave that um, vacant so that you know there's no confusion. But I wanted everybody to know what really those costs are that um, entire state's going to pay for. And then also with the revenue projections, keep in mind it's just a snapshot in time based on the projections that were submitted. So with that, Planning Commission did recommend approval. Thank you, Patsy. And I do have a speaker request for form from Mr. Hanny Shaffey. Would you like to address the committee at this time? Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. I'm here just to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right. Chair would like to recognize Alderwoman Drew. <laughs> um, yeah, Hanny, I just have a, a couple questions here. Um, I always like to support a TID or a TIF when it's economic development, and and um, so I, I will support this. Um, however, could you give me a little bit more of an explanation of the commercial mixed use that's going to be on this property? There is, uh, uh, we're in negotiations for uh, a big office building about roughly in the neighborhood of between 60 to $100 million. And then there is a hospitality uh, uh, feature and then some minor retail. Is the this. hospitality uh, feature, is that the same as the activity center that, that it, Patsy mentioned? It is part of the activity center. It would be a hotel and a few restaurants up there. But activity center to me, it means something different. So could you define that please? Uh, I don't really know what, you know, Pat, if you want to handle that. Thank you. Let me pull up that slide. That's um, specifically from our comp plan. Okay. <coughs> so an activity center includes um, services, office type um, uses, and um, employment and civic uses. Oh. So it's not similar to the, the activity center just up the street. It's, it's more a, a consolidated uh, business use. A business use. Okay, thank you. That, that helps me a little bit there. And then back to Hanny. Um, on your proposed improvements, I was, I'm uh, pretty impressed on the realignment of Promise Road um, and that your group is going to be paying for that. Is that correct? We will be funding the uh, TIF for Promise Road, but anything other than that will be paid privately. Okay. All right. That answers my questions. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? If not, I do have a couple. So, Patsy, if you don't mind um, answering a couple for me first, um, I'm intrigued to hear that you, in part of this agreement, so that would be the resolution-100 on here is the, uh, the agreement plan. That's, that, that's just the project plan. Okay, but in the, in the project plan, is that where you said that you were going to include language that the finance charges cannot be reallocated to cover co capital costs? Correct, and, it, and if you move forward with that recommendation in the project plan, then our uh, legal staff will make that um, change in the agreement that will be coming forward as well. Thank you. Joel, can you confirm, because I, I, this is a different answer than what I asked on Monday. Monday I understood that we couldn't put stipulations within an agreement that um, future councils could not reallocate finance charges. Will this work if it's put into the agreement that future councils cannot reallocate finance charges to capital? I mean, no. Um, agreement, the the development agreement is an agreement between the city and the developer. Any party to an agreement can later amend that agreement and say, okay, things have changed, this is a difference, uh, we're going to amend the terms of the agreement. So on behalf of the city, if a future city council chooses to amend and remove that provision from the agreement, they could do that. Now obviously if you include that in there, so future council members looking at it understand that it was something that was discussed and it was a condition of approval, 
Now that makes it less likely that they are going to do that, or at least there's going to have to be more of a discussion and a good reason for it. Whereas if it's not addressed, you could easily argue, well, obviously it wasn't a concern or it wasn't part of the consideration for the city's promises in the agreement. But if it's specifically in there, even though they could change it, it will make it more difficult and there'll certainly be more of a discussion about it, I would think. All right, thank you. And uh, Patsy, thank you for that. Um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, another one, um, just to make a comment on this, because Alderman Laurenti isn't here, is that when we do an economic or do a TIF based on economic conditions, the primary question that Alderman Laurenti always asks is, would this current development continue forward without a TIF? And that has to be the primary question that the council members should be asking themselves. I mean, what the city gets out of this is promised road, but there's a few other things included in there. So uh, are you comfortable that the negotiations, and sorry, this is coming from our recent visit with Sioux Falls, because Sioux Falls city staff negotiates much harder with developers to make sure that they get a really good benefit for the city out of these things. Are you comfortable with your negotiations that you're getting the best bang for the buck for the city on this economic tip? With our current policy, staff does not have the ability to really do those kinds of negotiations like Sioux Falls. Um, that's really the TIF committee's uh, role. And well, thank you. I've sat on the TIF committee and currently, I mean, I had a, an alderman ask me on Monday, well, the TIF committee recommended this, so we need to support them. And I told him, so now you know it's one of the five males. <laughs> I said, I've sat on that TIF committee. And believe me, when it comes before the TIF committee, it is so upfront, it's such an initial committee that there is no real data. It's a concept. So if you want the developer to have a chance at trying to apply for a TIF, you almost have to say yes to let them go out and flesh things out a little bit. So I don't, now that I've sat on the TIF committee, I don't put a lot of weight into that committee's recommendation. Sorry, need more information <laughs> than what they get. And I'm not, saying it's, I'm not saying it's against them. I'm saying they really don't get a lot of information at that initial stage according to our process for TIFs at this time. So um, my understanding, Joel, is that we are currently looking at revamping or reviewing our TIF criteria. Is that in the works? Uh, yes, we are. The state's also looking at these. I will say, I just want to be clear on something. You should not consider what's in front of you a negotiated agreement between city staff and the developer. This is the developer's proposal. Now, that doesn't mean the developer maybe hasn't asked some questions or gotten some input from staff and incorporated that into their proposal. But it would, I, I feel like it may would mischaracterize it to imply that it was a negotiated agreement and that these terms have all been hammered out prior to being presented to you because staff really, as Patsy indicated, that is not staff's role in these, the processing of these requests at this point. So the negotiating people, oh, I, I see that I've got uh, Mr. Ken Young that, uh, in queue. Did you want to respond? In yes, answer to I, I just wanted to affirm uh, that that is the situation with the staff's role. Uh, currently, we are in process of reviewing the TIF policies. We are looking forward to seeing what comes out of the state legislature on their proposals. Uh, we understand there are some uh, new recommendations and perhaps some tighter criteria that will come out of that, but we are looking ourselves at uh, a tighter process, uh, stronger criteria to uh, be eligible for a TIF into the future. So uh, as many things may change as well as process, including the role of the committee. All right, thank you. And so just with that being said, again, I do appreciate the people who serve on the TIF committee and my comments are not directed at them for making a bad decision. My comment is they are not presented with a lot of information to make a really informed decision. Patsy, you've reaffirmed, as well as the support from Mr. Young and Mr. Landine, that staff really is not in a position to negotiate with a developer. So when a TIF application is made, it's really the developer understanding our TIF criteria and putting together a plan that has to come before city council. So I'd just like to take this minute to remind all of our city council members that the 10 of us are the negotiators on this TIF. So if there's anything else 
that a committee member wants to see or Monday night, if there's any type of renegotiation or review uh, before a TIF is approved, it lies with the decision of the city council to approve a TIF based on our current criteria. And the only reason I'm bringing that up is I did stream Public Works yesterday, and I do know that there was um, a motion made to keep something in committee so that um, staff would have an opportunity to kind of review something. Um, e even though I know there was some dissension that that may not have been good for that project because it was a very complicated project because again, it deals with the future. Um, I just want to remind the city council uh, members that keep your hats on because once this is approved, it can be modified by future councils, but it, it's approving an, another TIF in our area. Patsy, my next question. When you gave us the diagram on the incremental base that is set, or sorry, the base that is set, mm -hmm. and then any additional value taxation money is the incrementally portion that goes back to pay for infrastructure when it's approved in a plan. Um, one of the things that, because you mentioned the, the I think the ranch, that was that the amusement park type thing? Was that on this piece of property? It, it was uh, a year and a half ago. So when the base is set like that, does, is the base set at the value with those structures already removed off of it? Or is that value set at what it was prior to, how is the base, what triggers the base value? The base value was established by the Department of Revenue in Pier, and we, when we send the information in, our estimates are based on our property um, information that we have from our equalization office, um, but the base value that you saw today does not include any structures. Those were already removed. All right, so um, it's just the land that at... Uh, other than that residential structure. Okay. Um, so then... The other question I had on here was the underlying TIF, because this is an overlay on an existing TIF. And you did bring up that the city council approved two other TIFs late last year. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I know that the values on those TIFs, and you did indicate that um, I think the one that went to Black Hills Energy Corp um, may not pay out because there's an underlying TIF in there. And those values were based on some development happening in TID 70 itself, I believe it's apartment complexes, and those have never been constructed. Is that correct? The revenues used with this particular application include the building permits for the eight apartment complexes that it has been, we, we've received building permits for eight apartment complexes plus a hotel um, just off of Moon Meadows. One of the issues that we found in looking at all of the building permits up to October 31st is uh, the revenues in Tax Increment District 76 are not what they had um, identified a year ago. They're about 16 million low. Okay, and is TID 76 that you're mentioning that one, is that that Black Hills Energy Corp one? No, that's uh, Buffalo Crossing. Buffalo Crossing. So. But Buffalo Crossing is still estimated out based on your latest projections to pay off even after 70 is paid out? Correct. But you know, when you, when you look in an overlapping TIF, um, all three of those existing TIFs today are any revenue generated in those all go to pay off 70. And then after that, the revenues are individual for each district. And because the revenues in 76 are lower than originally projected, it impacts, you know, the revenues for the other two districts. Because they're all interrelated mm -hmm. as far as paying off based on um, the projections of the information at the time. Correct. And so not only were the apartments not constructed in TID 70 that was supposed to help pay for itself as far as the underlying TID, but the value that was originally estimated for the Buffalo Cross TID came in $16 million light. The, the um, building permits that were used for the revenue projections, yes. So when we're looking at an, at an economic um, engine here, it, it just seems to me that we should be cautious approving another TID that overlays another one when we currently don't have evidence of an economic turnover that matches what was projected to start with. 
just just um, as a side note, with or without with with or without a TIF, um, as proposed today, any structures included on the property within the um, proposed boundary, those increments will still go to pay 70. Correct, but we don't have, the taxpayers don't have to wait for other infrastructure right. to be paid on top of that since we have, since we're piling on TIDs on top of another one with very little activity on that original TID. Correct. All right, uh, Mr. Shaffey, I see you back, did you wanna uh, make a comment based on the questions I'm asking? A couple of things. The economic development definition of a TIF by the state is one is not really related to the real estate tax generation, but it's related to the economic impact in the community. The 76 or TIF 76, which is Buffalo Crossing TIF, it still pays off. The building permits that Patsy mentioned it's the taxable building permits because we sold some of the ground to the hospital, which is going to generate about roughly 250 jobs, which is a huge economic impact in the community, but may not generate the real estate taxes because it is a nonprofit. It's not taxable. It's still 76 will pay off as a TIF, uh, and you know we got to realize that 76 has got about roughly uh, close to $70 million worth of construction in it, or $60 million, between the hospital, the hotel, and the townhouses. Yes, we did not have the restaurant or the gas station. We sold the lots at that time. They were anticipated to start construction, but they have not yet because they're waiting for the hospital. So therefore, uh, the TIF 76 is actually a successful economic impact on the community. Uh, it still pays off. TIF 70 has slowed down, but you know, it, there was no mention on the lack of development in TIF 70, which is really the one that should be developing faster because it's been created almost eight years ago versus TIF 76, which was created only two years ago. So, and we anticipate this TIF will pay off faster than either one of 76 or 70 because most of the structures or, it, or all the structures within it are going to be for-profit organizations or tax-paying entities. For-profit does not mean that it's a huge profit or whatever it is. No, those owners of the lots are uh, organizations that are tax-paying entities, so therefore it will pay off fast. The uh, other thing is, you know, and, you know, we mentioned something about the negotiations or what have you. Yes, this project has been on the board for almost a year or 10 months. There has been a lot of talk back and forth with the staff. As a matter of fact, the original layout, which is the alternative layout, which legally we could do without building a promised road and will not require the TIF if the council chooses to go that route, we would welcome that and we would have less risk as developers to just build uh, that connection to the frontage road, but it's, that's not the safe option for the taxpayers. Currently, all the lots that are along the service road where the majority of the construction could occur are platted lots, and those lots can be built on utilizing the service road utilities and road as access road without building any portion of promise road in front or behind those lots. So I just want to caution you, this has been on the drawing board for a long, long time, for almost 10 months, and there has been a lot of holding costs. Uh, dragging this along will not get promise road built. I guarantee you that. Thank you. Thank you. I still have questions about that because without Promise Road, I don't see how the residential portion of that piece would fit in. But um, Patsy, going back to the rest of the questions on this then. So if the council were to approve this TID, does this TID take into account the apartments that were supposed to be built when the discussion of TID 76 and 77 were held a year ago? Or are those, since they were not 
built, are, are those not even included in the consideration of this TID paying out reasonably? They, they are included because those building permits have been submitted. So the revenues for the apartments and the um, hotel on Moon Meadows are included in these revenue projections for the application in front of you. Oh, so there have been building permits actually pulled. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they've been issued, but we do have those applications that um, are being reviewed as we speak. Okay, so uh, I was starting to feel better there and then you switched it over on me again. So you're saying an application has been submitted, but it hasn't, there's still no, it's going to happen. Well, um, in, order to, in order to review that many building permits for you know, those um, larger residential structures, it takes some time to review them. And you know, they're currently in the process of doing that. Okay. Yeah, I was starting to get a warm fuzzy and it backed off again. So, uh, Chair would like to recognize Alderwoman Drury. Thank you, Chair. Patsy, I'm just a little confused. So, you showed the plat of the intersection changing and it taking over the service road to the north and the south of where 16 intersects with Catron. And most of those were platted on the north west corner of that. Most of those were platted as residential. What's, am I right? No. In this view before you, this is the residential lot. It's a 40 acre residential lot. Okay. And this is, I know these lots are here. I'm not exactly sure about these lots down here, but there are, this is the existing service road. And so there's access to this lot, access to this lot from the existing service road. And I know that DOT is in negotiations for some right of way and uh, control of access because of the upcoming um, realignment of that intersection. But I know that because they're still current, DOT is still currently working on that intersection and the study's not complete, um, it might be another eight years before it's actually programmed and under construction, under design and construction. So, you know, it's still, we're, we're still working on the potential for the intersection right here. But Hanny's right, with the existing connection to the service road right here, they can access all of these lots with the existing facilities. Okay, and then when the, but when the new building would come in for the intersection, would that affect any of those access rights or roads? The serv if, if the service road remains, um, there are some issues with that alignment. Let me get to that alignment. So you can, you can generally see the existing lot. Here's a lot here, there's a lot here, a lot there, and then this right here. So the service road comes in like this, um, but with this alignment, you know, it's gonna be pretty close right there, and it's, it's gonna potentially create some issues with the construction of this new facility that's been proposed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other further discussion? Uh, Chair would like to recognize Alderwoman Drew. Thank you. I don't know how much time I have left, but um, uh, as a council person, we like to say we create jobs, and we don't, but we can pave the way and make it easier for jobs to be created here in, within the city. I think this is one of those projects that does that. Um, I understand uh, Alderwoman Scott doesn't really I um, think the TIF committee is the best recommendation body for these things, but they did approve it, along with the, um, the planning commission, who is made up of developers, engineers, city planners, um, uh, construction owners, and I don't, none of us are that. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Amanda has a very astute financial mind for city things, um, but for the most part, I have to rely on the recommendations of other committees and staff. 
So that's why I'm going to support this um, particular TIF because it creates jobs and it's been approved by people that have thought about these things and hopefully have thought them through enough for the benefit of the city. Thank you. Any other committee member? There is no motion on the floor. I would entertain a motion of denial, but anybody else have a recommendation to send to council? I move to approve. Got a motion by Drew to approve, second by Armstrong. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Here. There's one no from Amanda Scott. That's okay. Item number 11 is to authorize the mayor and finance officer to sign an agreement between the city of Rapid City and the Rapid City area schools for the purchase of school district's ownership interest in the city school administration center, which is this building that we're sitting in. Uh, I have a motion by Armstrong to approve. I've got a second by Drew. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I have questions. I do have a clarification. Um, basically, uh, the recommendation from staff, because there is no attachment, is to send this to council without recommendation. So, um, Alderwoman Armstrong, if you're making a recommendation to approve, you're making a recommendation to approve what? Because there was no attachment. So, what are, what are you approving? So if I can rephrase and ask you, so are you making a recommendation to City Council to approve and are in favor of the city itself buying out the Rapid City Area Schools portion of this building um, based on the amount that was um, announced in the paper as far as what the city was going to be paying but withholding a revenue funding source to come before council at a later date? Can I defer to Joel Landini? Joel, would you like to answer or help Alderwoman Armstrong out? Sure. Um, you know, normally I, I don't like asking you to recommend something when you don't have it in front of you, which is why I would say take it to council without recommendation. But I think on the other hand, in this instance, we know what the, the basics are. We don't have the details of the agreement yet, but you will have that by Monday night. But the basics are that we would purchase out, we jointly own this building with the school district, the mayor has outlined in his letter that we would take over the entire building. Obviously, this is based on the school district's announced intent to move into the former Black Hills Court building. Rather than the amount in the paper, I would say the amount identified in the mayor's letter of November 14th, which was $2,904,450. I think it's appropriate since you don't have the agreement in front of you to, if you wanted to recommend your support or lack of support for the basic premise, which is to uh, buy out the school's interest in the property at that amount. Um, right now, we had a discussion before the meeting. I think at least Alderman Scott and maybe some of the other aldermen are still trying to work through where they think the appropriate funding source is. For the school district purposes at this point, I think what's important for them to know is that we're committed to buying the building or buying their interest in the building. And if we need to, I would ask that the part that be delayed is the specific funding source with the understanding that we support this in concept and we're going to proceed with it, but we need to figure out how exactly we're gonna pay for it. And I'm also working through some, some other issues that I would include with the agreement when I send it to you as far as some of the funding source issues. Um, if you wanna do that, I think that gives the school district what they need because if, if you were to reject or if the council was to reject the proposal, then obviously the school district and the YMCA would need to potentially go back to the drawing board. So. We just need to know at this point if you're committed to the plan and are on board with it. And if you are, some of those details perhaps can be worked out as far as uh, what funds we're gonna use to pay for that. 
Thank you, Joel. So a simplified version is using the dollar amount that Joel Landine stated, and your motion is to show support and in favor of purchasing this building. Yes. And the seconder yeah. agrees with that statement? All committee members understand what they're voting on? Mm -hmm. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Got a motion by Drury to adjourn. Second by Drew. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.